Well, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the first webinar in our Healthy, Safe, Productive educational series. Today's webinar session topic is What's Keeping You Up at Night? Nine Key Workplace Health, Safe, Health and Safety and Wellness Investments to Reduce Your Organization's Risk and Boost Your Bottom Line. So just before we launch into the webinar, I just need to bring to your attention the disclaimer we have. So I'll give you just a few moments to read the slide on the screen. So as we start the webinar, we'd like to thank our series partner and supporter for the Healthy Safe Productive Series, Business Depot. Now, for those who don't know the Business Depot, they're an accounting and full business advisory firm based in New Farm, Brisbane, and they're on a mission to help passionate individuals and businesses reach their potential. This Healthy Safe Productive Series forms part of the Business Depot's Depot Extra Series, and is an expanded version of their hugely successful Depot X Series which features presentations from a range of industry experts from digital media through to outsourcing through to occupational health and safety. So if you've not heard of the Business Depot or if you'd like to find out more, please visit their website and you can see the details on the slide here. So your webinar presenters today are myself, Joe Kitney from Kitney Occupational Health and Safety and Katrina Walton from Wellness Designs. Just as a quick background to myself, I'm the Managing Director of Kitney OHS and we provide services across heavy industry, manufacturing, construction, maritime, local council and service industries, both in Queensland and also across Australia. And you can probably tell from my accent that I come from the UK, though I've actually been here in Australia nearly 10 years and I've worked in health and safety for about 20 years. So as an OHS professional, I've got a particular interest in due diligence, governance and management systems. And in my spare time, as well as being a mum to three children, I'm a visiting teaching fellow at the London South Bank University and a chartered occupational health and safety professional with the Safety Institute of Australia. So I'll just pass over now to yourself, Katrina, to introduce you. Great, thanks Joe. And just very briefly a quick summary of my background. So I'm founder and director of Wellness Designs, a boutique workplace wellness consultancy company. And in essence, we help Australian organisations create healthy, safe and high performing workplaces. And we specialise in strategic consultancy, speaking and training services for workplaces, government agencies and also industry groups. And we've had the great pleasure of working in the field for the past 20 years, delivering multi-award winning programs both nationally and internationally across the world. So thanks very much, Joe, and back to you. Thanks, Katrina. And so hopefully with this combination of both wellness and also workplace health and safety expertise, you'll find the webinar not only inform informative, but you'll also leave with some practical takeaways for your business. So as we start on the webinar, I'll just take a moment to explain how it fits within the wider four part series. As professionals working in businesses and as small business owners ourselves, Katrina and I both know how important it is to have a safe and healthy workplace and staff who are fit and able to perform at their best. So for any organisation, regardless of shape, size and the industry it works in, these are absolutely critical in order for the business to, to perform and achieve its goals. So the Depot um, Extra series, the Healthy Safe Productive series, started in October this year, 2015, and is being run as a series of webinars and seminars. And you can see on the slide here the four parts of the series, which are really designed to leave business owners and managers with um, good information, feeling um, inspired, and then also some practical takeaways that they can take back to their own businesses. So Katrina, from your experience, what sort of challenges are you seeing within the workplace? Yeah, Joe, as you mentioned, I'm a small business owner myself and also married to a small business owner. And like many of you probably listening today, we certainly have our um, take of restless nights. And ultimately, you worry about how you're going to attract customers and secure work, how you're going to attract and retain 
you know, top talent, how you're going to bring out the best in your team, how to, as we've said already, create a safe workplace and prevent workplace injuries and how to manage the ebbs and flows, you know, of the business as well because ultimately what you're we're all wanting is a healthy bottom line. And, and we, when we look at a snapshot of small business in Australia, it makes up 96% of all businesses of which 46% are within the private sector. What's interesting over and above that is 70% of all businesses are actually family-owned businesses which, which have their own unique characteristics and often challenges associated as well. And probably unsurprisingly, small to medium business are also less likely to offer employee wellness programs. So that's, that's a lot of employees and workers within Australia that don't have access or, or benefit to such programs or initiatives. 24% of owners work 51 plus hours per week which was recorded in a recent study within Australia. So we're working often harder and, and longer. And also 45% of owners are more stressed this year than 12 months prior, according to a recent study that was done by Officeworks. And what was interesting about that study, Joe, was that the level of stress scaled up depending on the size of the business, with those business owners employing five to 19 staff requiring the most support for managing their well-being, compared to 24% for sole operators who are reporting themselves as less stressed. And 70% of owners from rural areas reported themselves as being more happy and fulfilled compared to those living in the metro areas. So you could potentially argue that those living in the rat race are feeling that those stresses more so. And there's a quote from this office work study that says, you know, I've always wanted to start my own business as I wanted more flexibility and, and better work-life balance. And I think for many who are, you know, taking the leap from the corporate cubicle, you know, often that's the perception entering into, you know, starting and running a small business, but sometimes the, the reality can be quite different. So that's a little bit, a little snapshot there. So if we go then to the next slide and we look at how to make the most out of this webinar today. So you'll have the opportunity to ask some questions as, as we go along in today's session. And there's just a Q&A panel that you'll see where you'll be able to enter the relevant question and then just simply hit on the send button. So we look forward to receiving some of those questions through. Thanks, Katrina. It's always useful to um, understand how a small or a medium-sized business may may particularly feel some of the challenges um, within the economic environment, obviously, that, that Australia is now operating within. So as we look at the, the content that we'll cover in our webinar today, um, we'll have a look at um, some of the business traits that we see within high and low performing organisations. Um, we'll look at nine key investments that, that um, Katrina and myself um, believe are important for managing workplace health and safety and well-being at work. Um, and as you think about your business in the context of those nine key investments, we'll also provide you with an opportunity to do a quick check on how well your business is faring and to identify some areas that perhaps you may want to, uh, to think about taking action or getting some, some support in. And at the very end of the, the webinar, we've also got some slides with some further information. So what I'm going to do at this point, Katrina, I'll pass over to you and if you're able to take us through the first part of the webinar. Great. Thanks, Joe. So when we're looking at what's keeping you up at night as a small to medium business, often there's many restless nights for a lot of the reasons that we discussed earlier and ultimately how to maintain that healthy bottom line. But the good news is that investing in the health, safety and wellness of your greatest asset, which is your people, can support you in achieving these goals. But as a small to medium business, you might feel overwhelmed when it comes to tackling health, safety and wellness within your workplace. And it's probably not helped by a limited budget, by overextended staff and a lack of in-house expertise often. And it's probably just one more thing on your to-do list. But we also know that where workers' health and safety fails, that there are significant consequences for both the workers and the business. So I guess in setting out our vision then subsequently for this Healthy, Safe, Productive series was to really educate and empower SMEs and with a view to creating thriving businesses which foster a healthy workforce, ensuring health and safety is both well managed but also enables productivity. That will enable them to manage those health, safety and business risks. That will help foster that awareness and personal responsibility for health, safety and wellness amongst workers and managers. So it really is that sense of shared responsibility. 
preventing and reducing the, both the number and severity of injuries and illness within the workplace. Because at the end of the day too, it's hard to be a safe worker if you're not a healthy worker. So these two areas very much go hand in hand. So promoting worker health and wellbeing and capacity to work. So not only employees physical capacity to perform the job required, but also their mental capacity as well. And subsequently, one of the spin-offs is increasing that workforce loyalty and commitment. And we know that healthy employees are up to eight times more engaged. And I know safety, Joe, I'm assuming there's lots of similar stats around that as well. And also enabling that continuous improvement then in business growth. So that's certainly what we're setting out to do with this series. So if we look at the integration between health, safety and business, there's a lot of work-related factors, such as the hours we work, such as the job roles and associated demands that can have an impact on our health behaviours and subsequently health outcomes and flow on to things like health and safety performance and all of those on business outcomes. So if you look at a simple example such as shift work, we know that employees who have a shift work lifestyle tend to make poorer nutritional choices and tend to have poorer sleep hygiene habits. And you only have to look at some of the physical and, and mental tolls that like the fly in, fly out lifestyle has been very well documented, not only on the individual, but also to their families as well, as far as strains on things like relationships. Similarly, there's a lot of things such as the health outcomes. We know, for example, that overweight and obese employees, not only are they much more likely to suffer with musculoskeletal injuries, but when they do get injured, it tends to be, they tend to be off for longer. So that can obviously impact on health and safety performance and subsequently the bottom line. Similarly, there's a lot of things within our personal lives. We don't just leave our personal lives at the door when we come to work. So things such as lifestyle factors, our you know, family situation, if we've got carers' responsibilities or childcare responsibilities, that can have a flow on again to the workplace. And what we are seeing more so these days is when that collide happens. When you look at, say, sedentary activity, we are becoming increasingly sedentary in our working lives due to mechanisation of work and technological changes. We're becoming increasingly sedentary in our personal lives. And they're now calling it, you know, sedentary activity in the new smoking. So regardless if we are, you know, undertaking formal physical activity each day, it's actually still classified as an independent risk factor for chronic disease and places as a much higher risk of not only musculoskeletal disorders, but also chronic disease and even early death. So you can see how, again, it's hard to be a safe worker if, if you're not a healthy worker and it relies on employees being fit for work both physically and, and mentally. And we also know that healthy employees are more productive employees. And there was a study that was done by Medibank Private and they found that healthy employees who had two health risk factors for chronic disease or less, a health risk factor being something like high blood pressure, they were three times more productive and had nine times less sick leave compared to unhealthy employees. So it really begs the question for the, the small medium business owners listening today that how much is poor employee health and wellbeing costing your organisation? And, and I guess most importantly, what's the cost of doing nothing? And then if we look at the most important asset, not, let's not forget them, the business owner. And having been married to a small business owner for close to two decades, you know, I've certainly seen firsthand the physical and emotional toll that running a small business can have on the individual. You know, the long hours, the inability to switch off, the cash flow pressures, the staffing issues, the sense of feeling overwhelmed. And I know these are just some of the daily stresses I'm sure facing many of those listening in today, and let alone a vacation. You know, what's that? Uh, so without health and wellness as that foundation though, business owners aren't going to be able to fire on all cylinders. And as the late and great Stephen Covey, author of the iconic book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People puts it, you know, we often get so busy soaring, so to speak, trying to get the result, that often we forget to sharpen our saw and really nurture our physical, our mental, our spiritual, our intellectual being to really improve our capacity to produce those results. And this has flow on impacts not only for the business, but also to the business owner's family as well. And there's another saying which goes that many people will sacrifice their health to gain wealth and then sacrifice their wealth to regain their health. And I, I know I've certainly observed that time and time again, working with a lot of executives and CEOs over the years. 
So you can see hopefully there's a number of parties that really have a vested interest in having healthy and safe employees at work. You know, obviously from a government level, given we spend a third of our life there, it's an ideal setting you know, for preventative health, but obviously ensuring a safe place for work. The employer for the reasons we've already mentioned and obviously for the employee and their families as well. So it really is a win-win scenario and, and ultimately healthy employees equal a healthy organisation which is going to equal a healthy economy, of which small business is certainly the beating part. So if we go then onto the next section, we're going to now look at the learnings from high and low performing organisations, which Joe's going to delve into. Thanks, Katrina. And um, absolutely right. Um, when we look at the difference between high and low performing organisations, I do believe that there are certainly some lessons that we can learn. So I'm sure many of you will have seen the image that you can see on the slide here. Um, so the concept of moving perhaps from a small tank to a larger pond or the differences between the blue sea and the red ocean. And so what these concepts talk to is the difference um, between a high achieving or perhaps uh, an organisation that isn't, isn't performing so well but may have aspirations to do so. So how can we tell a high performing organisation from a low performing organisation? Um, we can ask ourselves what sort of traits they have and I guess the question would really be to those that are listening as to, to what do you think of as high performing? So for some of you, that might be market presence. So for example, there may be a fast food chain that is um, present in most towns. And I'm sure Katrina, I'd hope from a wellbeing perspective, you, you might drive past those rather than dropping in, but they're certainly there. Um, is it brand recognition? So do you choose to get one product over another product or choose to purchase from one supplier as opposed to another? Is it the profit numbers that are perhaps given in an annual report? So you'll know that there are some businesses in your own industry, your own business networks, um, that you would recognise as performing well, and some perhaps that you would recognise as performing not so well. And so there's absolutely something that sets these high-performing organisations ahead of their competitors. But what is it? Well, um, on the following slide here, you can see some traits or characteristics that were identified um, from the Aberdeen Group research, but also from separately by Andrew Hopkins through the um, work that he, he did. And the book actually he produced on the very subject called Learnings from High-Performing Organisations. And what I wanted to do was just share with you seven of those key characteristics or traits, um, just as an opportunity to really think about, well, um, do you have that in your own organisation, both as a, as a trait, but also are you realising the outcome that those traits can have? So if we just have a, a look through those, those traits that you can see here, high performing organisations tend to be much more strategic, they identify and they recognise their risks, but they also capitalise on opportunities so they can help themselves get into new or future markets. Um, they generally have or, or use their senior executives to champion or lead um, or drive across the organisation and they also monitor. So they check to make sure that, um, that what is being led is also um, being achieved. Um, they generally have cross -con good cross-functional collaboration. And when we think about health and safety, just as an example there, a good health and safety function within an organisation will stretch not only from um, its, its dedicated area, or it may be as a, a part of a, a, a key role, but it would stretch into procurement in relation to contractors and suppliers, perhaps into training, to induction, and across other areas, including recruitment um, and also performance management, as well as the tr more traditional health and safety management. So you can really see that there are opportunities to learn from, from these high performing organisations. Now, conversely, in low performing organisations, we, certainly I do in, in my consultancy practice, may often see people working in silos or competitive, um, fairly territorial perhaps in terms of their, their key areas of work. The business may not necessarily have a, a clear understanding of its goals or those at the top may, but across the organisation there may not be that same clarity. And, and from a HR perspective, they may not necessarily be identifying or addressing issues that arise and in fact at times turning a blind eye. So all of these can absolutely impact on the performance of the organisation and will start to take it down that path of it being low performing um, as opposed to, to high performing. So what I want to do now is to really think about, well, what are those key investments to help a business move itself into that high performing space? 
So um, Katrina and I, in the preparation for the webinar today, and in fact, the webinar series, really took a step back and thought about um, from our experiences, both working within organizations directly, consulting to organizations, and also um, running our own businesses, what those key investments were from a health, safety, and well-being context. And what you can see on the slide here are the nine key investments that we identified. What's interesting to note is that actually they're good business practice and good business management. Um, they just happen to be related to workplace health and safety and wellness. So in essence, from what you can see on the slide here, a business in theory should make a decision about the, the industry it works in, the service it provides, and the, um, the outcomes it hopes to achieve as part of the business it, it's running. So they make those decisions. There are then a flurry of activities that happen. So from a workplace health and safety and wellness perspective, we've identified these as the right business activities to support the business achieve its outcomes. And what we'd like to do here um, is just cover or share with you um, insights into five key areas, and that's leadership and values, assess and plan, meeting obligations, health and well-being, and then also data and reporting. So Katrina, I'll pass over to you at this point so that you can lead us nicely into leadership and values. Great, thanks Jo. And, and just as you were speaking then on that last slide, we just had a question come through around, you know, how do we get that senior management buy-in for this important area where health, safety and wellbeing, where it just doesn't exist and they seem very passive around it. So, and, and I guess it's obviously really critical for three reasons that we get that buy-in. As, as with anything within the workplace, any initiative, you know, management support is unsurprisingly the make or break, number one. Um, number two, it's also really important that managers be well to, to lead well as well and to be effective, resilient and, and high-performing leaders. You know, health and wellness as a foundation is, is critical to that. And the third reason, as Jo, I'm sure you've seen with a lot of your clients as, as well, both on the positive and negative, a leader's style and behaviour ultimately affects not only job satisfaction, but it affects safety, it affects an employee's stress and also their health behaviours. Uh, and I know I've certainly been within organisations, you know, where some of those managers should have come with a health warning label, you know, it could be hazardous to your health. And, and, and ultimately they are the barometer, aren't they, of the organisation and, and they can have a ripple effect. So I guess to that question that came through, how do we get that, that buy-in? And often it comes back to, you know, what is keeping your GM or, or, or the business owner, what is keeping them up, up at night? And it's looking at scratching where they itch often and how investing in this area can really support some of those organisational goals. And, and two, once I guess we've we secured that support, it's really being clear as to what the key accountabilities and expectations of that leadership team are. Firstly, number one, allocation of resources. Because I know within certainly the wellbeing area, and Joe, no doubt as well within the safety sphere, you know, a lot of these things don't run themselves and, and they can't be run off the side of the desk and they need an investment in not only resource but also in staffing and, and allocated budget to really drive the health, safety, and wellness agenda within organisations. At a policy level, really making sure, again, that it's embedded into the DNA of the organisation so it really does become part of business as usual. Particularly from a wellbeing side, often it can be perceived as a nice to have or, or a bit of fluff. Uh, from a leadership and accountability point of view, so it's how you can make your leaders accountable for, again, maintaining a safe, health healthy workplace and often organisations who have done this well have built it into you know things like their position descriptions into their performance management frameworks into their reward and recognition strategies so managers are measured against these indicators involvement so making sure again leaders are involved in the identification of what safety wellbeing needs are within the workplace, are involved in the development of the associated initiatives to address these things and involved in also the monitoring and ongoing and continuous improvement. And from an active participation point of view, really making sure that you know leaders are walking the talk and being effective role models as well. And again, I've done this in, you know, done very well within organisations where leaders have not only visibly but also verbally uh, really endorsed and, and 
been effective role models for that organisation. So they're just a few areas, Joe, as far as the leadership and values. And then if we move to the next session, looking at assessment and planning. So again, this is really important to really determine what are the core organisational needs from a health, safety and, and wellness perspective to ensure that where your organisation, particularly for SMEs, are spending their precious time, money and resources are really being spent in the right place and are really going to get you the best bang for your buck, so to speak. So that will be determined by looking at a variety of, of different data, so looking at maybe you know, trends within the organisation, have you got some concerns around some safety related trends or coming back to again what some of the drivers are and, and goals for the organisation, you know, are you trying to be a market leader, is one of your goals about being an employer of choice and attracting and retaining you know, top talent. Then looking at what needs to happen to address those goals and address those needs within the organisation. On the back of that, what resources might be required to, to make that happen. And again, that's not just from a dollar point of view, but also from a, a man hours point of view as well, which is often very overlooked. Who's going to be responsible for those actions and ultimately accountable for ensuring that those things happen? And then looking at some realistic timeframes around that as well. And so often we use that analogy of SMART goals, so making sure they're specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, they're realistic, but also they're timely. So not biting off more than you can chew, often you know, doing a few things, doing them very well. Always back to that saying, you know, not quality, not quantity, is, is something that brings very true for a lot of the work I do with, with our clients. And how will those results be evaluated? And that's really often an overlooked step as part of that initial assessment and planning. So having the end in mind, and often what you're going to be measuring at the end is going to again come back to what are the key needs and drivers in the first place for you investing in that area. So there are a few things to think about, Joe, and I'll hand over to you now around meeting workplace health and safety obligations. Thanks, Katrina. And in fact, just before we head into looking at health and safety obligations, um, what I'd actually like to do, if you don't mind, is just to run through a few of those tangible goals that you can really think about setting from a health and safety and indeed a wellness perspective. Um, and this is a really important part of um, then being able to evaluate um, the outcomes of actions that are taken. So from a health and safety perspective, the sort of goals that you might want to set are establishing a health and safety management system, um, putting in place a schedule of health and safety meetings and checking that they in fact are run and run effectively, um, running health and safety training, making sure inductions are done when you have new starters or new contractors, and then um, perhaps running, um, organising for regular health and safety inspections or perhaps an annual audit of your health and safety arrangements. So they're all what we call lead indicators. They're the things or the KPIs, the things that actually start to drive health and safety. From a reactive perspective or an outcome, um, you can certainly look at the sickness absence statistics, um, the lost time injury frequency rate, or other first aid or incident statistics to understand where you're sitting for health and safety and aim to drive those down. Um, and by driving those down, you certainly help the business bottom line um, and you therefore able to direct your precious resources into other parts of the business. Just moving on then into meeting health and safety obligations, I'm sure that most people that are listening will be familiar with um, health and safety legislation across Australia. But what I will do though is just run through the legal framework for those who maybe aren't up to speed um, with the way in which um, legislation sits currently here in Australia. Um, so certainly we've had a, a big exercise, uh, probably happened now about five years ago, um, to try and harmonise legislation across Australia. And so at this current point in time, all except Western Australia and Victoria um, have in place the Work Health and Safety Act 2011 and a number of codes of practice that sit behind that uh, those pieces of legislation um, to help guide um, benchmarks and, and, and give standards for practice for health and safety management. So if we just look at the legal framework, 
as with most legal frameworks, there's an act, the Health and Safety at Work Act, that sits at the top, which establishes duties. Um, we then have the regulations, the Work Health and Safety regulations that sit on underneath, and they really provide more detail over the expectations that sit within the act for key areas of risk like noise, confined space, asbestos, lead, working at height, um, as well as an overall duty of care to ensure that, that there is effective risk management so far as reasonably practicable. So those two elements create the legislation and then sitting beneath that are the codes of practice which whilst not um, legally binding or legal requirements they can be used in a court of law as evidence of a standard of practice so it's really important to be not only across the legislation but also those codes of practice. Um, and then other guidance that you can read might be Australian or industry standards industry guidance material and then other health and safety material that may be available on the regulators website. It's also worth bearing in mind that the health and safety legislation calls up other pieces of legislation so if you're working in a building the Build Fi Building Fire Safety Act and regulations may apply. In most workplaces the Electrical Safety Act and regulations will apply. So just looking at those key duty holders um, and duties, um, within the work health and safety legislation, there's four key duty holders and you can see them on the slide here. Each of them are, are responsible for some very specific obligations. The officers, um, so that's generally your boards, your directors, your senior executives, your, your CEOs, legal counsel, CFOs, they sit at the top of the organization and they're really obliged on a personal note to demonstrate due diligence and you can see on the slide here what that due diligence what those due diligence requirements are and their obligations are to ensure that the PCBU so that's the person conducting the business or undertaking so that's the business or the organization complies with its duties so just looking at the slide here, you can also see the PCBU has that duty of care to ensure so far as is reasonably practicable the health and safety of workers and others. And you can see listed on the slide there the six key dot points that sit within that primary duty of care. And these are an obligation for all workplaces that fall within this legislation. Within the, the other two duty holders then you've got workers and they're required to take reasonable care to cooperate with any reasonable instruction, policy or procedure that's laid down by the organisation. And in relation to others, so this might be your customers, your visitors, fellow contractors that are working on site, they must also take reasonable care of their own and others' health and safety. And what's really worth bearing in mind is that one person can have one or more duties. So you might be a business owner that is both the officer and the PCBU or the organisation that is the PCBU. Um, and you may also then provide services on another company's premises or site and you might be considered an other to them. So you have to be really across the full breadth of those duties um, and who those duty holders are. So from a health and safety perspective, we look at the size of the legislation and we can see that there's a, a, a fair raft of um, sections and elements that um, we need to be across in order to ensure all obligations are met. But if we just take it back to perhaps its most simplistic state, really what health and safety is about is managing um, your people, making sure that they are um, fit for work, where they're not fit, that those risks are managed. Um, and obviously we have to take into account HR or IR obligations in relation to, to how we manage people within the workplace as well as health and safety obligations. We need to ensure that the plant, the equipment, the tools that staff are using at work are suitable, fit for purpose and um, well maintained and well serviced. We need to ensure that the environments um, where people are working are obviously um, safe. Now these might be the premises they're working in but that might their environment may also be a vehicle they're driving, they may be working overseas or in rural or remote locations. So it's really taking into account where that work is undertaken. And then also the activities or the processes of work. And obviously, depending on the organisation, will really depend on, on what type of work is undertaken. So what I'll do at this point is, is hand over to Katrina so that she can talk a little bit more in depth about how you manage health and well-being within the workplace. Great. Thanks, Jo. And that ties in really nicely with your previous slide, I guess, in relation to your four Ps. We similarly adopt an integrated approach to health and wellness within the workplace, which is in line actually with the WHO, the World Health Organization, Global Healthy Work Model. And 
what's unique about it doesn't just focus on the individual, which traditionally if we look back tw you know, 20, 10 years, even today, you see it quite a lot where when people are addressing health and wellness and in the workplace, they're very much focused on the individual and the onus is very much on them. And typically uh, they offer one-off you know, initiatives such as health checks or flu vaccinations or a stress buster seminar. But what that fails to do is acknowledge the, the multiple determinants that impact on health and wellness within the workplace. So, for example, at a cultural level, you know, what are the norms and values of the organisation? Is there a long hours working culture? You know, are you as the business owner potentially the worst culprit? in that uh, an environmental level are you making the healthy choices the easy choices for your employees you know you say serving up the same you know high fat high sugary pastries at your team meetings where maybe you could be offering you know a lighter option or at a policy level you know how again are you integrating health and wellness into the dna of the organization are you providing things like flexible working arrangements which can help your employees with that juggling juggling act between work and home and and what australian research tells us is where that integrated approach is taken that not only are you much more likely to get high participation rates but you're much more likely to positively impact on health behaviours and, and subsequently on the chronic disease of employees within your workplace. And there's a, a favourite saying of mine, it says, you know, massages on Mondays don't make up for boring work, lousy leadership and, and no career opportunities. So really, unless you get into the heart of that health and wellness matter, you know, it's only ever going to be seen as a band-aid or, or a bit of fluff. There's no point having a stress buster seminar or, or sending your employees off to, you know, a stress buster session if you're not addressing those deeper psychosocial issues within that workplace. And if we look at then some tips for cost-effective delivery for SMEs, so whilst you might not have a state-of-the-art gymnasium or a cafe serving fancy salads like some organisations, the fact is small business certainly has many advantages for delivering a cost-effective wellness strategy. Firstly, much less, you know, less bureaucratic decision-making and change can happen often more quickly. Tend to typically have, have closer connections as well, so you don't have the same barriers to communication internally, and often you're more closely linked in with the community, certainly in my experience. Also caring more about their employees generally, particularly given that family businesses account for 70% of all businesses in Australia. In my experience, owners often see their employees as extended family members and often looking out for each other and any issues or problems are also much more difficult to hide. So all of these factors lead to much higher levels of engagement and also an ability to build a supportive wellness culture a lot more quickly as well. So if you're still not convinced, well, recent research from PricewaterhouseCoopers makes way, and, and they found that this study, research that was commissioned by Beyond Blue, that small businesses actually stand to gain the most from investing in the mental health of their employees. And whilst Australian businesses can expect an average return on investment in appropriate mental health strategies of $2.30 for every dollar spent, this jumped as high as $15 for, for small business. So what does this mean for your business? Well, with these advantages and a little creativity, an affordable and simple wellness strategy can be much easier to implement than you think. And we've already touched on a few of these already about the churning needs and interests. Also, a really effective strategy is to nominate an employee, um, ideally volunteering, um, to champion the strategy. And then looking to modify or extend policies that you might already have in place to really demonstrate your commitment. So, for example, you might have as part of your reward strategy, you might have you know, a Christmas function where maybe having it, sort of having it down at the pub, maybe you can have a family picnic or have some healthier you know, options available to staff as a way of catering. Also looking where you can to extend programs to family members. Often they can be the key health decision makers, you know, within the household. So, and often you can extend things at very you know, low or additional cost. Tapping into free or low-cost community resources as well. There's a wealth of free resources and programs available through your local council, through a lot of the not-for-profit organisations, through the likes of the Cancer Council, Beyond Blue, etc., you know, who are more than happy to provide you with support. 
maybe look at collaborating with other locals, small to medium businesses, and maybe organise some group activities or discounts on services. Maybe have a discussion with your local gymnasium or your local fruit shop about maybe some special initiatives that you could work on with them together. Or maybe piggyback with a larger business, maybe that's in close geographical facility that already has an established program. Or look at how you can integrate health and wellness into things that you're already doing. Maybe into things like your toolbox talks that you're already doing over the morning, having some health and wellness messaging or, or education through those mechanisms. Look at how you can create that supportive wellness environment for your employees. Maybe providing a nice green space where they can have their lunch and communicate and connect with their colleagues or again having healthier vending options available if you do have a vending machine for example on site and look at subsidizing activities or programs where you can as well I think it's really important that employees do contribute something whether it be time or digging into their pockets but again as an employer you know you might choose to co to subsidize or co-fund or maybe provide things within work time that are going to incentivize and encourage people to get involved so I guess on to our ninth investment then, which is data and reporting. And at the end of the day, you can't manage what you can't measure. And this is an area that certainly in my experience, and I'm sure Joe sees similarly, that you know, organisations spend a lot of time in the developing programs and, and implementing plans, but then fail to have, again, the end in mind. And from a wellbeing perspective, I know there was a study done by Bupa recently of Australian workplaces that were investing in the area of workplace health and wellness. And what was really surprising was only 12% of organisations were actually measuring that return on investment. So they probably weren't really clear about whether the strategies were really hitting the mark and were they getting the best bang for that buck. So it's having a really good sense in that planning stage of what outcomes or KPIs, as Joe said earlier, are going to enable you to best monitor and measure and track the progress of your strategy and plan. What will so you report Katrina, on? Katrina, we've yeah. just had a question come through on um, uh, wellness data. And the question was, can you give some examples of wellness data that could be um, monitored and then evaluated in terms of a return on investment? Yes, yeah, certainly. Thanks, Joe. And, and that's a, a really good question for, for two reasons. I think it's also in developing, particularly from a health and wellness strategy side, having a clear understanding and realistic expectations about what those outcomes will be. So in the first 12 months, for example, you would expect to see some immediate benefits in things like morale and, and engagement, which in larger organisations you may measure through the likes of employee engagement surveys or the like, or in small to medium organisations it might just be a sense of the, the feel and of the teamwork and cohesiveness with, within the group. Uh, again, for three to five years, for a longer period, what you're going to expect to be seeing is again, ideally, some shifts in the likes of absenteeism. Uh, you can have some more, some more sophisticated tools which measure things like presenteeism, which is a productivity indicator. So that looks at when employees may be at work, but for a health or wellness related reason, they're not performing at their optimum. So, for example, they may be grappling with a mental health issue or they might be suffering with chronic back problems that could be impacting on their productivity. We would also be looking to a lot of safety-related KPIs and looking at that initially as part of the needs assessment and so looking for some ideally positive shifts in that area. And, Joe, again, it's really going to come back to what are the drivers for the organisation in the first place. And I know some clients in which I work, one of their key drivers is about being a great place to work and being an employer of choice. So they will actually look to that done, they will ask that question when employees start their organisation, why have you chosen our organisation? And often health and wellbeing is, is one of the key factors, that sense of feeling um, cared for you know, by their employer. So it's certainly a great attraction mechanism. So to answer your question, Joe, to really come back to what the reasons are for investment in the first place. But certainly there's some traditional metrics um, such as your absenteeism, and injury rates, etc. Uh, so how will that information be captured? And again, that will depend, I guess, on the nature of that measure. And I should also highlight that whilst quantitative data, so some of that hard data is very important, also that qualitative data can often just be as critical and can often be even more powerful uh, in demonstrating the business case for investing in health, safety and wellness. So this is saying that, you know, you tell the numbers to the CFP 
CFO and you tell the stories to the CEO. And, and that certainly served me well in developing and implementing such programs where, you know, yes, the, the CFO might want to know what bottom line impact the program has had, but the CEO may be more interested in, you know, how many people, whether it be John who successfully quit smoking, you know, after 20 years and now has the energy, uh, you know, and breath to be able to play with his grandchildren. So not to forget that qualitative data as well. Um, who will be responsible for reporting? So again, that might, again, depend on the nature of the data that you're reporting. There might be multiple uh, people responsible, but ideally having a nice succinct scorecard or similar, we can bring that data together and at an easy glance, those key stakeholders can see, you know, how the organisation is positioned and, and travelling. And then what will happen to the information? So again, often I see a missed opportunity there with a lot of organisations. It's also obviously not only important to feedback that data and reporting to key stakeholders within the organisation, which is ultimately going to assist with planning uh, and targeting of future initiatives, but also using it as an opportunity to benchmark, you know, externally with other organisations as well. So using that as a bit of a yardstick to see how your organisation is performing across some of those areas. And that could be, you know, maybe even applying for an award, you know, an external award, or you might have other organisations as part of your peer group that there's a mutual benefit, you know, to benchmarking some of that data. So that's it from a data and reporting point of view. So on now to our business check back with Joan. Thanks, Katrina. And you uh, just um, just to follow up on that point about data and reporting, you're absolutely right. There are opportunities to benchmark across industry, um, and two very clear opportunities sit within workers' compensation um, premiums. So, if you were to look at the premiums that your organisation um, is currently paying, you're able to benchmark that across your own industry um, and also then across Australia or your state or territory um, on a more local level. So um, if you have premiums that are less than the industry standard, um, then it's an indicator that your claims rate, uh, your severity of claims and your type of claims are also less. Um, and a very good target is actually to reduce down your workers' compensation uh, premiums. Another form of injury data that you can look at, um, Safe Work Australia, they produce an, an annual report and that's based on the incidents and um, uh, claims data that comes through either directly reported to the regulator or through to the workers' compensation um, insurers. And you're able there to, therefore to benchmark by um, state and territory, the area within, the size of the business, um, the type of industry, um, male or female and there's some really good data there to be able to understand how your particular business may sit across across um, industry-wide and certainly drive through some some targets for for reducing down the toll of poor workplace health and safety work, uh, management so if we think now and look through into the business check, um, one thing that um, we didn't mention at the start of the webinar, but the slides will be available to you. Um, so once the webinar has concluded, they will obviously put the recording up and you'll also be able to get a copy of these slides, which will be important for you to be able to do your own business check. And what you can see on the slide here are those nine key areas or the good business practice areas that, um, that we uh, talked through earlier. Um, and then also just a consideration as to where your business weight may be at now um, in order to identify areas where you may be able to improve. Now, this could obviously be done either by yourself. It may be done as a part of a, a business management discussion or perhaps within staff meetings in order to get some, some feedback on how perhaps your health and safety representatives or your workers actually feel about your business practices in relation to health and safety and well-being management. Now, the, the relative um, importance of these areas will obviously differ depending on the business that you're in and the stage of that business within its development, whether you're a new starter, a new startup company or one that's perhaps been operating for longer. Um, whether or not there's some parts of your business that are functioning and operating very well and other areas that perhaps need improvement. But by going through each of these key areas, you will actually be able to, to think about the relative importance of them within your business, where you're at now, and then identify those areas that you could potentially improve on. 
from a, a decision making perspective, um, I tend to, to recommend that you don't identify too many areas that you need to take action on, but really the one, two or three really important areas that will genuinely make a difference or are very important at this, um, this stage in time. Um, from a, a work and workplace design perspective, which is number seven, it's just a, probably a reminder that our third seminar in the series does focus on these areas in particular. Um, and that's in relation to, for example, the layout of the workplace, the interaction of the worker with the work, um, work environment, and the choices that you can make to enable people to work safely. Can we get to the point now where we're starting to, to draw this webinar to a close? And what I'd like to do is to just talk about the importance of going the journey. Um, success is never achieved um, immediately or, or perhaps overnight, um, and neither is it a straight line trajectory. We often find that successful outcomes retire, require grit and resilience and forward thinking, some reflection, and it's the process of doing that that really helps a business to define who it is, um, how it goes about its business activities and what it expects of itself, those that it works with and those that it works for. And the same very much applies for health, safety and well-being management. And so if you can see on the slide here that we're very much of the view that successful outcomes are the, um, the, the need to, to unravel some of those issues that may sit within a business in order for, for good business success um, to be achieved. And what I'll do at this point is just hand back over to yourself, Katrina, so that you can talk about some of those useful resources that, that um, businesses can find across the internet. Great. Thanks, Jo. So what we've tried to do here is really to draw out some resources we felt would be of particular benefit and interest to SMEs. And, and Jo has provided some there for high and low performing organisations, a lot of which she referred to, Eric earlier with some of Anthony Hopkins work in the Aberdeen group. The Queensland Government also have a great website called the Healthier Happier Workplaces of which they have some great case studies and, and templates and tools uh, which are freely available and downloadable. Uh, sites like the ABS again as we were talking about earlier from a benchmarking point of view can be very useful. Workplace Health and Safety Queensland again have a plethora of resources and tools there. One of the uh, updated ones recently is the Organisational Systems Benchmarking Tool, which now includes a, a wellbeing dimension as well. So certainly worth checking out together with their small business checklist. And again, again Safe Work Australia has some useful statistics from a benchmarking perspective. From a more health and wellbeing point of view, again, there's just a few that we've highlighted there, particularly from a mental health point of view that are specifically targeted towards SMEs. And the Heart Foundation has a great guide providing some cost-effective uh, and shoestring ideas uh, for running an effective health and wellness strategy. And Joe's also listed some great international resources there as well, again, with some great downloadable tools that you can use and adapt for your organisation. So as far as future webinars and seminars, Joe, again, I might let you provide a bit of an outline of what's coming up. Thanks, Katrina. Um, so yes, this webinar that we're, we're presenting here now just sits as one of a four um, series. And so coming up, we have Balancing the Pendulum, um, where we'll talk about striking the balance between employers and workers' rights and responsibilities for health and safety. So that webinar is coming up um, on the 19th of November. Over in uh, 18th of February 2016, we've then got a, a great seminar planned where we'll look at um, making the right choices, the easy choices. And that's very much about workplace design not on both the functional um, uh, level as well as a process level um, and then after that we look at beyond the silo and that's a webinar that will be held in March 2016 We've been really pleased that you've been able to join us for the webinar today. And if you'd like to get hold or contact our presenters, both myself and Katrina would be absolutely delighted if you wanted to contact us. And on the slide here, you can see um, both our emails and our mobile contact details, and also some links to, the web, to our websites. And so on behalf of Katrina and myself, thank you for joining us at today's webinar. We hope that you found the content useful and that you'll take the time to join us at future seminars and webinars and see you at the next one. Thank you very much.